It's time now to talk about Neanderthals. For many of us, Neanderthals might be the first thing when we think about when we think about human evolution. That notion of our archaic self, some primitive version of us that occupied caves and dealt with primitive stone tools sometime in our paleo past. But really Neanderthals are referencing a specific population coming from a specific time and place. What we usually refer to when we're talking about Neanderthals are so-called classic Neanderthals coming from Western Europe. Extending in sites basically from Central Europe, like Germany, into Northern Italy, to Northern Spain, but really specifically areas of France, where classic understandings of Neanderthal behavior, Neanderthal morphology, and Neanderthal archaeology developed. But actually Neanderthals are far more variable than this. You can see from this map actually the distribution of sites found all throughout Europe, and extending actually even east of this into areas as far east in Central Asia as Uzbekistan, but also continuing the Middle and Near East, North Africa, and broad expansive regions. But Neanderthals actually varied in their distribution across time. The expansion of glaciers associated with the onset of peak glacial maximums would have reduced the available area for Neanderthals to live throughout big parts of northern Eurasia, specifically northwestern Eurasia. Today we'll talk briefly about some classic Neanderthals, particularly those coming from France, La Chapelle, La Fercy, Regardou, and we'll put that into the context of some of the European variation that we introduced last week. So recall last week I introduced you to the site of Atapuerca, and specifically the locality of Cima de los Huesos, which has produced, again, more than 4,000 hominid remains. And you can see two of the better preserved cranial specimens here, Atapuerca 4 on the left and Atapuerca 5 on the right. And recall that I introduced you to some of the features that characterize these European Middle Pleistocene populations, particularly a projecting midface. Notice how here in the specimen, as you go from the zygomatic arch towards the nasal aperture, it's a continuous, obliquely oriented structure of bone, almost again as if the face has been pulled forward. Fairly prominent supraorbital torus, high nasal bones, the projection of the occiput in the back, something known as an occipital bun, are all features that we associate with these middle Pleistocene European populations. We can see many of these features from Atapuerca replicated in the Greek skull Petrolona that we also introduced last week. But with Petrolona in your mind, look at this specimen coming from Italy, from Monticello where again we see this continuous projection of bone from the zygomatic arch heading towards a very big broad nasal aperture, and a broad nasal aperture that has well-developed bony structures bracketing the left and right side of it. Again, we have a high nasal arch, we have projecting supraorbital tori coming on the front, existing as two bars, much as we saw in the earlier specimens. And these are some of the beginnings of really classic Neanderthal features. To understand the true classic morphology of a Neanderthal, we can look at this specimen from La Chapelle in France. Again, we have a projecting supraorbital torus. Uh, we have zygomatics that face somewhat laterally, again associated with that pulled out appearance of the midface. We have very high nasal bones projecting anteriorly from the mid-orbit. We again have a very large nasal aperture. It's a little bit difficult to see in this image, but we have a projecting occipital bun in the back of the skull, seen right here in this image. We have a small mastoid process, but bracketed by a very large paramastoid process, the secondary bump highlighted here. These are all classic Neanderthal features. Features that we see replicated in the very large sample of Neanderthal specimens that we have coming from Western Europe between about 60,000 and 120,000 years ago. We can see some of these features in interior view here with La Chapelle on the left and another classic French Neanderthal, La Fercy, on the right. Again, we have a double arched superorbital torus that is at its thinnest laterally and its thickest in the middle. We have a fairly prominent interorbital area. Um, we have again these zygomatics and cheeks that come directly into this large, huge, in fact, nasal aperture. Look at the size of the nasal aperture in these two specimens. It's very large. And notice the uptick of the bone associated laterally with these structures. So the bone actually brackets this large nasal aperture in a way that's distinctive in the Neanderthals. We have very prominent Facial foramina, actually. These exits, actually, for the nerves which innervate the facial tissues of these specimens. Some of these features are thought to potentially be related to the cold climate occupied by Neanderthals during Ice Age Europe. 
The projecting mid-face of these structures houses large sinuses within the bones, within the maxilla, within the frontal, within even the nasal cavity area behind the face of the, these specimens. These large sinuses may be associated with heating and adding moisture to the very cold, dry air that Neanderthals would have faced in peak glacial conditions in Ice Age Europe. So some of the facial morphology that's so distinctive in these classic Neanderthals may be a result of adaptation to the cold climate conditions they occupied. There are a number of features that also characterize the mandibles of Neanderthals as well that are distinctive from anatomically modern Homo sapiens. This mandible from Regardou highlights many of these features. Looking at the teeth, you'll notice that there's a gap here behind the third molar before you hit the ascending ramus. This gap, known as a retromolar space, is something that we see commonly in Neanderthals, associated again with that large projecting midface that they have. The large midface means that their maxillary dentition is drawn out anteriorly, which means the mandibular dentition also gets drawn forward anteriorly, which helps create this space behind the teeth in the mandible. This also changes the morphology of the ascending ramus. In modern humans, the mandibular condyle and this projecting structure of the ascending ramus, known as the coronoid process, tend to be at the same height. In Neanderthals, we'll see that this ascending process, or the coronoid process here, is much more vertical than the mandibular condyle. This in turn makes the curvature of this coronoid process and the low point of it much more posteriorly on the specimen. In modern humans, this usually sits right in the midpoint here, where we have a condyle, a coronoid process, and the dip between them right in the middle. We see this structure differently in Neanderthals. We also lack a chin in most Neanderthals, though there's no projection to the mental eminence of these specimens. Even though, recall that in some much, much, much earlier European specimens, including those specimens from Dimenisi, we did see a little bit of a mental eminence. Again, this could be the product of this anterior movement of the midface an associated anterior movement of the dentition in the Neanderthal specimens. But again, these are all classic features which we see in especially Neanderthals coming from Western Europe. Next week, when we talk about the origin of modern humans a little bit more, we'll talk about how these features don't always manifest themselves, and how at times we see a really a mixture of modern and pre-modern features. Thinking about the Neanderthal morphology in a little more detail, we can also look at this reconstructed skeleton of Neanderthal. Again, we have abundant Neanderthal remains coming from lots of different places, which have allowed us to do these reconstructions of a complete Neanderthal skeleton. And there are a few notable differences between this Neanderthal and your typical modern human skeleton. One is that Neanderthals tend to be stocky and short in terms of their overall stature. So it is not a very tall specimen, and especially the lower limb is relatively short. Not so short as, say, an Australopithecine, but still relatively short compared to a modern human. And again, this can be somewhat an adaptation to climate. In addition to being somewhat short, the limb bones of Neanderthals tend to be highly flexed. So if we look at actually the curvature of this femur, we'll notice that it's highly flexed, and we can see this actually a little bit in the anterior view as well. This is thought to be a result of actually strong muscular action during development. In other words, Neanderthals were highly active and engaged their muscles considerably, giving their limb bones more overall flexure, with the idea that this flexion is basically associated with that strong muscular activity. There's also some differences perhaps in the upper body, again perhaps associated with cold adaptation in these Neanderthals. The adaptation again to ice age environments in which they would have perhaps had to cover long distance in very cold terrain, perhaps dragging material along with them as they went. Whether it be the carcass of an animal that they've hunted down, or materials associated with simply living in ice age Europe. So as we can see, Neanderthals represent a distinct and clearly identifiable classic morphology. At least in the most western extent of these specimens, we see clear evidence of features which are identifiably Neanderthal, especially when the total combination of them is present. However, as we'll look forward next week a little bit more, we'll see that as we move both later in time in the Neanderthal sample, and also to more non-Western European populations, such as those from the Levant, we'll see the integration of more modern features into the overall Neanderthal morphological package. In other words, their distinction is not entirely so clear when you look across the whole range of time and space. This observation fits into the already I stated relationship that Neanderthals and other archaic populations, such as the Denisovans, have contributed some genetic ancestry to living modern humans. So the Europeans might simply be that, 
a specific population adapted to a specific time and place. In this case, the glacial ice age periods of later Pleistocene Europe. 